Good morning, everyone. Welcome to another episode of The View, the Ships, um, online weekly talk show. And my name is Christina Rivera. I'm joining you from Charlottesville, Virginia. And um, we are thrilled to have uh, Alexandra Dixon with us today. And I'm going to uh, introduce Alex in a little, in just a few minutes, but wanted first to give an opportunity for our co host to introduce themselves. So um, take it away, Aisha. Hi, I'm Aisha Hauser, and I'm in Seattle, Washington. Um, Michael. Good morning, everyone. Happy New Year from Peekskill, New York. It's good to be back with everyone on The View. And how are things, Jessica? Things are good. Happy New Year, everybody. I'm Jessica Star Rockers. I am in the Seattle area as well. I am also um, fielding your questions and comments on the Facebook Live chat, which I will pass on to our hosts and uh, guest. And um, I'm also on Twitter, hashtag The View. And those of you that are regular viewers or listeners to the podcast know that Meg Riley is usually a co-host, um, but she's not feeling well today. So we're sending lots of love out to Meg and hoping that she's uh, feeling better real soon. So um, I'm thrilled to be with you all so soon in the 2019 new year. Um, so it's really nice to see all of your faces and, and uh, hear your voices. So um, the view has been, at least for me, as I reflect back on 2018, one of the things that has really kept me going and kept me grounded and um, kept me in, in Unitarian Universalism some, some days, some weeks. So I'm super appreciative of uh, the group that are here and to everybody who listens and watches and supports the Church of the Larger Fellowship uh, in making this happen. So that was just my, my brief New Year's check-in impromptu. Um, so we have Alexandra Dixon with us. Um, I know Alex Gosh, Alex, we've known each other for a couple of years now, two, three years. I can't even. Yeah. And Alex is a Unitarian Universalist activist from the D.C. area. And Alex, I'm going to let you introduce yourself any way that you you want to. Sure. So I think in terms of this discussion, it's important to say that I'm Latina. I'm originally from Bogota, Colombia. Um, and so my interest in immigration is that I am an immigrant myself. I came here to the States when I was one and a half. I came because I was born with a disability called spina bifida. And back in 1982, they essentially told my parents, we don't know what we're doing with her. So take her to the States. The kids are surviving, expensive to keep us alive. And it was routine to let children with my disability die. So I am extraordinarily grateful to the United States for giving me the chance at life. And a little plug about this uh, whole uh, public charge thing that uh, we're having. Um, I hadn't been allowed to immigrate to the United States. I am now a fully employed, it's important to take a chance on people with disabilities because we have a lot to offer. And I'm, I'm that, I'll talk more about that later, but I'm really proud of how people with disability immigration justice. Thank you for joining us today. We really appreciate it. And um, your audio was cutting out a little bit when we were in, when you were in doing your introduction. So we may have to go to audio and just video, but we'll, we'll try it a little bit, a little bit more. Um, and, and I think it's really important that, you know, we're get, we're, the episode today is the immigration crisis at our border right now. Um, at our southern border. Um, and we're also next week going to be hearing from Latifa Woodhouse is gonna talk about um, immigration crisis in uh, Europe and what that's looking like there. And I think it's really important that, um, that we recognize that you know, the rhetoric that we're hearing um, isn't just in the US. Um, you know, we, we just saw Brazil um, elect somebody who is very uh, enamored of um, what 
our president and our administration is doing at our borders and and with you know around immigration as well as a lot of other policies um so i think it's important to note that this isn't just something that's going on here um but we do want to to talk a little bit about what's going on and and one of the reasons why i invited alex and we did invite um one other um unitarian universalist activist who has been on the border um doing some of the same work that alex has been doing um and unfortunately he was uh, ill today and wasn't able to join us um but alex i wonder if you could just tell us a little bit about um your experience there um why you went um where you went because i think that's really important um to know sure so um back i suppose in early november a call went out through um, the Unitarian Universalist College of Social Justice. And the call was, um, if you are bilingual, English and Spanish, we need you to come and help with the refugees. And there were two opportunities, one in El Paso and the other in Guadalajara. And the one in Guadalajara was for a month and I couldn't take a month off. Um, and El Paso, if you're bilingual English-Spanish, the they ask that you come for a minimum a week. If you're monolingual English, they're asking that you come for two weeks. So um, I took a look at my finances. I, looked, I took a look at my PTO and I said, I can afford this. And I said, I've got the time. And I said, I got to go. Um, the images of what had been happening at the border in... San Diego and the images of people dying and children dying. I just, I had to go like, I'm Latina. These are my people, you know, if you've got the time and you got the money, I'm like, how can I not go? And everybody's always been thanking me. And I'm like, I, I just couldn't imagine not going. Um, so I went to, um, I worked with a, an organization called Annunciation House. They are Catholic, um, and what would happen on a normal day, you would um, get a text in the morning that would say that you're expecting 40 refugees. Well, you would get a text in the morning saying 300 refugees are coming, 40 are going to this place, 40 are going to that place, 40 are going somewhere else, 50 are going somewhere else. Um, so you'd get that text maybe about nine in the morning and the refugees would come any time between one and four. Um, and so what I did once the refugees got there, as soon as the refugees got there, you would receive them with this great big pink sign that said bienvenidos. And we would give them some caldo, some soup, because oftentimes the refugees have been in detention for a week, if not longer. They haven't been given warm food um, over and over and over again I got told we ate frozen burritos and like the whole system sucks and the whole system's terrible can we do one small thing to make it just a little bit better as we are dismantling the system that needs to go away totally can we warm up the burritos please um and so they would get that soup and then you would process them and so you'd ask people where are you coming from you know, do you have any other family members in detention? Where are you going? Is anybody sick? That sort of thing. After that, we would call their contacts here in the United States. Everybody had somewhere where they were going, someone that they were meeting, whether it was family, whether it was friends, that sort of thing. And so you'd call them and you'd say, I've got Alex Dixon here. She's in El Paso. And now it's up to you, family member, to buy either a plane ticket or a bus ticket so that Alex can get to the next destination. And so then we would get phone calls back from the family members once they bought the tickets and the, the confirmation numbers would go on a piece of paper and then we would help get people to the bus or to the plane, that sort of thing. So that's what I spent my week doing. So Alex, um, we hear, how was that coordinated in terms of who was who was contacting the Annunciation House and letting them know that that refugees were coming? Because um, I think one of the things, one of the developments that we saw, you know, right during um, the holidays, was that that even seemed to break down whatever that communication was 
um, because it was it looked like at least from you know news reporting that that refugees were just being dropped off at Greyhound and Annunciation House and other relief agencies weren't weren't even getting that notice. Correct. Um, my understanding is that they would get a phone call from ICE or a text from ICE. Um, <sighs> I had hoped to go down to Texas to do some more liberation work. Um, and quite honestly, this was not liberation work. And while it was really important and really good, and there's a part of me that's really proud of it, I'm very clear that this was not liberation work. This is working within the system um, and trying to make it better within the system. Um, so Annunciation House had a press conference right after what happened on the day before Christmas Eve and Christmas Eve, and they'd already gotten their 200 refugees that day. Um, on average, they're getting two to 300 refugees. And the communication system just broke down where ICE did not notify them that an additional 200 refugees were gonna be released. 212, I believe, is what were released the very late on the 23rd, my understanding, uh, is that they were released at like 11 o'clock at night and dropped off at the Greyhound at 11 o'clock at night, which is how the shelter that I was at with Annunciation House actually got started. Um, in October, they also had this incident where refugees were dropped off at the Greyhound and Greyhound called the cops, which I'm not thrilled about either. Um, and then the cops called Annunciation House and said, please help. And so the specific site that I was at opened up um, and was able to take in refugees. And my understanding of what they did on Christmas Eve is that while they were sorting out the refugees, city buses came so that the refugees could at least be on city buses. Because here's what I was not aware of when I went to El Paso. You think Texas, you think it's going to be hot. And no, it She cut off. <clears throat> so I think we lost Alex there for a minute. We'll let um, Jessica see if we can get her back. Um, hotel hotels. Oh, there she is. Alex, you, we lost you when when uh, you were describing how the weather is in Texas and is actually cold at this time of year instead of hot, as most people would think. No, I think we still lost Alex. Yeah, so Alex brings up a good point of, you know, working within the system and, and working outside of the system. And, you know, I wonder, I wonder what it looks like to, to do both at the same time and, and what, as you use, our role can be in there. Um. I think that's up to the individual person. I've had some conversations later about, well, you know, I work for the government and I can't risk my job. And yeah, okay, that might be a little bit of white supremacy there. You know, um, I am much more the nonviolent direct action person and I'm much more, let's confront these systems and confront these powers. And if I get myself arrested, then so be it. You know, that, that's what I'm personally willing to do in the name of liberation. Now, it's been two or three years that I've been working up to get to this point. You know, I wouldn't necessarily want somebody fresh into social justice activism to risk arrest their first time out, because that's a big deal, you know, but you take your steps and you work your process. And, you know, the question I always ask myself is, what can I do next? You know, and so my next thing is, you know, nonviolent direct action, risking arrest, that, that's where, that's the level I feel I need to be at. And it feels like it is a both and all the time with, you know, people just needing to survive and then work to dismantle the system that's um, perpetuating, mind you, a policy. I mean, what, what I think gets lost is a lot of this started under Obama, well, before Obama, but Obama was the deporter in chief, right? So th this is something we've been living with that was put, you know, that has been in place even under democratic presidents. Um, and so this is a deeply rooted uh, host hostility towards 
uh, immigration policies, especially on our southern border. And like you, Alex, I'm an immigrant. Um, and it took me, I got here, I was about two. Uh, I didn't become naturalized till I was 19. Mm -hmm. I raised my hand. Um, I didn't have to take the test because I went through the US school system, but it took me a 17 years to get my um, official papers that I uh, belong here, which I do want to point out that the current administration, one of the things that is new um, in the list of heinous things happening is they're starting to denaturalize people. So even if you do have papers saying you belong here, there's now an effort um, to add to the horror show um, to actually take that away from people. So it's a both and, you know, people are getting dropped off. People are, are needing food, water, shelter, safety. Um, and the system is, is getting worse and worse. So it feels like there's just a lot to do all the time and, and we need to do the best we can in, in the capacities we have. Right, I wanna lift up a couple of things. Um, in the circles I run around in, there is a very big concern that once the threat of 45 goes away, that people will be like, whoo, we're done. We don't have to organize anymore. We don't have to worry anymore. And like you said, I've been organizing around immigration justice since Obama. Um, and so I'm fully prepared that no matter what happens in 2020, I have to still organize around immigration justice. Um, but I also wanna talk about opportunities for people to get involved locally because I recognize that not everybody can travel to Texas. It was about $500 total. Um, and actually that's cheap because I did stay at the UU house there. That was free housing. Um, I I didn't rent a car. Um, I got most of my meals at an association house. Um, so really my major expense was the plane ticket from the DC area to El Paso. Um, but if you can't afford that or you can't take the time off, my honest suggestion is to go down to your local Greyhound station um, and see if there are people who are getting off a bus who don't speak English, might look a little lost, might not have luggage with them might have an ankle bracelet on them because all of the refugees that I saw had ankle bracelets on them and see if you can help them get to their destination to their loved ones. Um, they're coming without money. Um, like I said, they're not being offered adequate food, much less clothing or um, blankets. And, and they call them yeleras, um, where the people are staying, which means ice boxes. So over and over and over the stories I heard were, it was cold, I wasn't given, warm food, much less adequate food. Um, you heard stories of there not being enough toilets, that sort of thing. So if people want to get involved, we need um, donations to Annunciation House um, in terms of money, um, but also go to your local Greyhound, see if somebody's needing some help there, needing some translation help, needing help with figuring out the system, getting to their next bus, that sort of thing. That's what, that's kind of what I think I'm going to be doing next is seeing how I can help locally at the Greyhound stations in my area. So, so pe people are just being put on buses mm -hmm. to all over the place where they might have relatives. I mean, I guess they're trying to get to to loved ones and and relatives and friends. Uh, is that is that? So it, I would find folks getting off the bus at the Greyhound station in New York, even? Absolutely. Um, so I saw people going to California and uh, New Jersey, Florida, South Carolina, Louisiana, um, Colorado. Nope, not Colorado, Utah you know, just to name a few, we processed 200 refugees in the week that I was there. Um, I volunteered for five days, and in those five days, we processed 200 refugees. So that's what sticks out in my, where people were going. So, um, one of the questions I had for you, Alex, in regards to, to all of this is, so this has picked up kind of a lot of um, 
play in the past month, but is the work that Annunciation House has been doing regarding um, basically, you know, transitioning the refugees to their to their locations throughout the U.S. Is that new? Is this work that they've been doing all along? They've been around since 1978, if I'm not mistaken. So they are there to um, help the undocumented folks who are coming through because being undocumented, you don't have access to food as much as you would if you were documented. You don't have access to medical services as much as if you were documented. So that's their reason for being, is to help the undocumented folks. To right. And so it's my understanding that these that the folks that have come from the migrant caravan from Central America, the majority of those folks are documented in that they are going through the asylum system. Correct. Yeah, that was a concern that um, some of the folks that I've talked to lately have had is, you know, I can't have it seem like I'm helping undocumented folks. And I'm like, you're not at this point. They're all refugees. They're all seeking asylum. Whether or not that will be successful, who knows? But, I've, you know, all of the people that I helped had ICE paperwork, were known to ICE, that sort of thing. Right, which I think is a really interesting um you know, kind of dichotomy because I've heard a lot lately in um, the past couple of months of people really wanting to make that clear that that the folks that, you know, have come from certainly this migrant caravan and there have been others um, are, who are coming from Central America um, are actually seeking refugee status um, as immigrants. And, mm-hmm. and I've supported the idea that yes, this is slightly different because they are um, they are coming from different countries, and of course, their experience um, and what's driving them um, may be slightly different. But I'm I'm also hesitating to make that distinction because, for some reason, it gives this idea that that there's that that status, that refugee status, or that documented status, somehow makes them. Uh, that their human right to migrate has somehow been affirmed in an official way that we don't see um, for folks coming from Mexico, right? Because- That that we're legitimizing them as human beings. Right. Right, yeah. I completely agree with you. Um, And I was gonna say similar that Immigration is a human right. Migration is a human right. Um, be and worth, no matter what. And so that's regardless of whether or not you have documentation status. Yeah, we want to keep. <clears throat> it's part of the commodifying of humanity. Is that there's, you know, only if you have papers, then somehow you're human um, and worthy of survival. And that, that's the part of um, violent extractive capitalism um, that has become just more and more insidious and sinister. And as you mentioned earlier, Christina, this president of Brazil, I think I, I couldn't even imagine a more horrifying person at this time other than 45, but, but this dude, I mean, you know, the Amazon are the lungs of the earth and he's willing. I, I, I don't even, I mean, I genuinely am, spe- I'm, I'm rarely speechless, but this dude is genuinely off the charts um, with his horrorness. But, <clears throat> but, but commodifying humans and saying somehow they're more worthy when there's a piece of paper attached to them is the part of, you know, kind of modern society that is just so, um, it's beyond disappointing. It's just, um, it, it, what it's going to do is lead to our demise. I mean, I think if we don't, you know, we don't see each other's connected, we don't see, you know, there, there's that part of our souls that has been eroding. Um, that's just so tragic. Mm-hmm. Um, Alex, I wonder if you could tell us a little bit. So, you know, we saw um, actually a, a protest um, somewhat direct action, well, I'm not sure if it's direct action, it's definitely a nonviolent protest at the um, 
at the California border and we had a lot of UU um, faces there. Um, Susan Frederick Gray was there, Ranwa Homani was there, um, Leslie Takahashi was there. We had, we had um, you know, and those are just a few, few folks that, that I know off the top of my head that were there, um, you know, protesting um, the, at the border. Um, but that, that seemed like it was a very kind of finite, um, you know, um, awareness raising um, action. And I'm wondering when, uh, when you were at Annunciation House, um, what the UU presence is looking like there, or if that's an area of where we can grow into. So um, at the UU house where I was staying, I had two roommates who were also UUs from San Francisco. Um, and then of course, Zeb was actually at Tornillo, um, which is the detention camp for the unaccompanied minors. That's about 45 minutes from El Paso. So yes, absolutely, there's been a, a UU presence. Absolutely, we need more people. We could use more people. Um, there's a gentleman who has basically been at Tornillo for like two months. And I think he said that he was gonna leave soon, um, maybe by the end of January. Um, and the thought is, is that Tornillo is gonna get shut down. Um, but I think to have a continued UU presence might be a good thing to make sure that it is actually shut down and that these kids are getting to their families and or people who are sponsoring them. So can you describe Thorneo a little bit for folks, like what, what that specific place is? Sure. Um, so it's about 45 minutes to the Southwest of El Paso, you're in desert. So uh, during the day it gets up to about 50 and then at night it's really cold. Um, you can't see much and that's because Customs and Border Protection has done some stuff so that you can't see much. Um, for example, there are, there's a chain link fence and they've put tarps up on that chain link fence so that you can't see in, so that the refugee kids can't see out, you can't talk to the kids that sort of thing. Um, so driving in there, um, you see tents, big, almost like wedding tents or party tents. And you know that the kids are there. Um, where I had a really tough time is that I've got a lot of friends who are undocumented. And I just thought about them and that this could have been them. And it's that moment of if these kids are crying, who's going to hear them? If they're screaming out in pain or hunger, who's going to hear them? Like, you don't hear them, um, at least when I was there. Um, I, they did a protest called Christmas in Tornillo, and they sang um, the Ancicos, which are um, kind of like carols, but in Spanish. Um, and, you know, they've uh, had the Virgen de Guadalupe, the Virgin from Guadalupe, um, and that sort of thing. And you hope that these kids know that people are out here fighting for them. And you hope that they know that people are out here that care. Um, but it, it, it was just really desolate, really, it, it was just not a good place. You know, they've got one like um, um, like fire hose that gets hooked up that you, the, I forget what it's called, the thing that you hook up the fire hoses to when there's a fire, you've got one of those and that's where they're getting fresh water if they're lucky. Um, and then many times the people who work for CBB are getting bottled water like trucked in and that sort of thing. So the children that are that are at Thornia, they are unaccompanied minors. They don't have, um, or they have been separated. Um, so I, 
my understanding is that they're unaccompanied minors. Um, my understanding and from what I saw when I was working with the refugees is that they are not separating minors from adults anymore. And this is what I saw at my shelter. I will tell you that I did meet a mom who had her 17 year old son with her. And then you asked her the question, do you have anyone left in detention? And she said, yes, I've been separated from my 19 year old son. And the last time I saw him, I saw him across the room and I saw him signing a paper and I don't know what that paper was. I don't know if that was self deportation papers, that sort of thing. Um, and what she was told when she was captured by ICE is that she would never see her 19 year old son again. Um, and that she quote unquote, should have known better than to bring her 19 year old son because she would be separated from him. Um, and just the inhumanity of that, that's the day that broke my heart. And I'm trying not to be fragile, you know, white Latina here, but that's the day that I went home and I literally threw up because of the inhumanity of this system. Mm -hmm. I, you know, don't separate families, period. Like, this is not hard, people, you know, but, but that's the story I carry with me and will carry with me for a long time is that mom being separated from her 19 year old son. And she couldn't stop crying. And of course she couldn't stop crying. I don't blame her at all. You know, um, she asked me to pray with her and I'm more on the agnostic atheist side of things. But in that moment, that's the most loving thing you can do for that mom is to pray for her, pray for her son, pray for his safe return. Yeah, yeah, I think I think you're absolutely right in in being there for them in a way that that she needed that. Mm -hmm. um, and you know the the other thing that goes through my mind as we're talking about all of this is, you know, all of the folks that you were interacting with were the folks that they let through, and there's large numbers that they are. Um, turning away and, you know, basically dumping in Mexico in the same way that they're dumping the processed refugees in, um, in, you know, uh, all across the border and in, in U.S. cities there. Uh, I know, I think it was the mayor of Tijuana was just saying, you know, we cannot, not only the influx of people from Central America, but then the numbers that are getting turned around by ICE, um, and not allowed through is is you know stressing their systems as well, right? Um, yeah, I mean this whole system is just incredibly messed up, um, and you got to get to the root causes as, as to why people are migrating, and the root cause of why some people are migrating from Honduras is that the US intervened in Honduran politics back a few years ago and has caused absolute chaos. And nature hates a vacuum, right? And so people have stepped into that chaos and people without real good intentions are causing lots of pain and suffering. Um, I heard stories of um, a gentleman who was a business owner and as his business grew, it attracted the attention of some of the gangs and they threatened him and they said, you have to pay us a monthly stipend or we're gonna kill you. And at one point he couldn't pay the stipend and he goes home and there's a big X on his door. And that was the sign that his house was gonna get hit next. And so he went out of there. You heard stories over and over again of people working on farms, um, and not being able to pay for renting the house on the farm that they were staying at, not being able to pay for the food that they were eating, that sort of thing. Um, right? Reminded me a lot of the history of the United States right after slavery. Um, it was just horrific um, to hear these stories. Um, from Guatemala, I heard stories of a woman who lost her entire family in a volcanic explosion that happened in June. And I hadn't heard anything about a volcanic explosion. Um, and you go and you look and yeah, her entire town is just gone. So there's environmental justice at work, there's economic justice at work, there's 
also imperialism at work. Um, and these are the conditions that you've got to address in order to quote unquote, stop this refugee crisis. But also that language around refugee crisis, I don't like, because that's, I feel a made up term by 45 to whip up you know, anxiety about what's going on. People told me that actually the numbers of, of undocumented folks is actually lower now than it was four or five years ago even. So I, I, don't, I don't call it a crisis myself. I just say, this is refugees trying to get to the United States. Well, and I think it, it's so important to understand why, why people are fleeing violence and, and dictators and oppression in, in their homes um, because the current U.S. policies are creating, are going to create more refugees uh, pretty soon. Um, so the things, right. that we are, the things that we are doing currently to destabilize governments around the world um, and to destabilize the environment around the world are, are just going to create more refugees who are going to be seeking uh, safety for their families mm -hmm. uh, and themselves. So, you know, the, the whole we need to understand the, the root causes of it is just so important, I think. Um, mm -hmm. I agree. And I guess next week we will talk about refugees fleeing to, to the European Union because of the policies of colonialist <laughs> white folks. Uh, that have you know destab destabilized places like Syria. Um, it, it's happening all over the world, um, and the the right wing backlash to it is ugly. Yep. So. Yep. And in the meantime, people are fleeing and in danger for their lives and um, need some help. So it's right. There's a long-term strategy, but there's also this immediate people are dying on the border. Right. Um, someone was saying to me that what I did at the border is not social justice. And what I said to that person is that it's both and. Yes, the person is right. You need to have a long-term strategy to deal with the underlying issues so that the refugees aren't created in the first place. But in the meantime, you got somebody who's hungry, you got somebody who's cold, you got to feed them, you got to give them clothes. Well, and the bigger issue also is, is knowing this is this mass migration is going to continue happening with, with Syria. Actually, the beginnings of that was water was was environmental, um, and the root root and, and yes, political as well. But but we need to as humanity understand that there's going to be mass migration going on now basically for the rest of Earth's, or at least humans are on Earth. And so it's managing that because we have plenty of room in the United States, frankly, and Canada. So the issue isn't capacity, it's will and kindness. Right, right. And recognizing the spark of the divine in every human being, again, going back to inherent worth and dignity. And I think that's something, you know, as, as Unitarian Universalism, um, you know, as we experience that going into, into the future, that is going to be, I think, more and more of our call of, you know, of liberation is, is that both and of, of, you know, seeking to, to dismantle those structures and supporting the people who are being, um, who have no voice and, and who are being victimized in many ways. Um, Alex, you talked about the, um, <clears throat> the ankle monitors that people are being released with. Yeah. And um, in many communities, those ankle monitors are being uh, provided or not provided, being sold <clears throat> by private contractors who charge exorbitant fees for them, um, you know, $500 a month just to rent the ankle monitor, um, you know, 
$3,000 to replace it when you can get them, you know, for $300. Um, and, but if it's given, somebody's given the choice of being in ICE detention or, you know, being bonded out by a private uh, firm who will, you know, promise to take you to McDonald's and, and strap a monitor onto you, um, you know, there's, there's not a lot of, um, there's not a lot of people who would say, no, let me stay in jail. Right. Uh, let me stay, you know, away from my family. Um, and I think that that's another way that we've seen, um, you know, I mean, we've seen people start to become aware of the ways in which <clears throat> they can, from a grassroots level, um, while seeking to end bail and, uh, but still can provide bail funds so that we can have private nonprofit grassroots folks getting together, pooling resources to be able to, you know, bond people out. Um, we have people, you know, like the Colorado Freedom Fund who, you know, bond people out who are, you know, sitting in jail and, and this isn't immigration jail, but sitting in, in um, just local jails for $50 bond. And, you know, they don't have the $50 bond. Um, you know, so communities can get together and put those programs together very easily um, and then, you know, extract that out to the immigration bonds, which are much more expensive. Um, and while you're working to reduce, you know, from the systemic point, reduce and eliminate the needs for those bonds um, can also be working to support folks to, you um, to creating those bail funds uh, to be able to get people out um, of these these cages that we're putting them in. Yep. One of the things that I learned about the ankle monitors that I did not know is that they have to be recharged. And so I had one refugee ask me, well, are there going to be electrical ports on my bus? Because I've got a 20 hour bus ride and these have to be recharged every eight hours and I didn't know what to tell this person and that's just horrific to to just the whole system's horrific I mean putting ankle monitors on a person on a human being and then charging them for it and then telling them that they have to re you know electrify them or I'm sorry my brain is not remembering words right now but you know to keep them charged like that's just horrifying on so many levels yeah the whole ankle monitor um industry is uh, you know specifically as it relates to immigration has just been um exploded like the the profit margin for it is tremendous there's actually um a local group um that Ha runs the largest um, immigration ankle monitoring uh, firm in the U.S. and they they the New York Times I think put their business at, at uh, in the early years uh, at about forty million and it is only you know expanded from there and the you know the the folks that are coming out are thinking that five hundred dollars that they're paying is going towards their $3,000 bond um, and then come to know, you know, after six months, no, no, that's just the amount to have the, the luxury of, of being shackled um, while they're out. Yeah. Yes. So one of the things that I am also looking at on my own end is how do we do a effective systemic boycott of the companies who are profiting off of this misery. Because you need to hit them where it hurts. You need to hit them definitely economically. I think that's that's a really good point and, and definitely something that that you know as a Unitarian Universalist, I think one of the things that I found so powerful about the action that, that was at the uh, San Diego border um, was, you know, um, Leslie and Ranwa um, performing the wedding ceremonies um, yes. for 
you know, both same sex um, uh, couples who didn't have that opportunity, you know, where they were coming from. And, and actually, uh, uh, we had folks going there from Charlottesville, um, Charlottesville clergy uh, went, you know, a couple of weeks ago, and we're, we're, we're continuing that work. Um, and, you know, just I think the power of folks seeing clergy and people of faith doing this work cannot be over over emphasized. That when people see clergy and people of faith um, doing this work and saying this isn't right, um, there's a you know the U.S. looks they perk up, you know, like people pay attention to that. And that is one way for us as you use who have a lot of privilege, like you said, um, and maybe p folks can't take two weeks off, um, you know, to go to Annunciation House, but I bet that they can, um, you know, fund somebody else to go and do that who can. Right, right. That's essentially what I did. Um, a friend of mine was going to get me an e-reader for Christmas. And I said to my friend, that's a perfect, wonderful gift, very appropriate for me. But rather than an e-reader, help me fund my trip to El Paso. And so that's what my friend did. And that's how I got to El Paso. And then I was able to give a little bit of money to another friend. And that's how my friend Pete got to El Paso was from that tiny little bit of funding. And then I'm really grateful for the ways in which people showed up because people got really excited that I was going to El Paso and they're like, do you need money? Do you need money? Do you need money? And I'm like, I don't need money to myself. And so that first day I was like, don't send me money. And then we get to El Paso and the kids don't have shoes. They much less don't have coats. They need medicine. So I put a call out on Facebook and I said, Facebook friends, you know how y'all wanted to give me money yesterday? Give me money today and as much money as you give me by nine o'clock tomorrow morning, I will spend it in buying food and clothing and medicine for these children. Um, and I actually raised about $2,000 or so. Yeah. So I was really, you know, money for some people is easy. I, I recognize that not for everybody, it's not easy, um, but it's super important. And there is that question of, is it better to send money or is it better to go? Um, and from what I'm seeing from an association house in the last week, if you can get there, get there. If you cannot get there, but you can send money, send money. We all, you know, doing small little things can make this change. Um, most of my donations that I got were 10, 15, $25. That was most of my donations. And like I said, I got $2,000 off of that you know, so it made an impact. And I'm very thankful to the people who donated. Is there anything else that you think folks should know or about your experience that while you were there that, that really, you know, brought home to you how as Unitarian Universalists we can engage with this? Yeah. Um, people keep asking me, um, I don't speak Spanish. Is it worth it for me to go? Yes. There are things you can do even if you don't speak Spanish. Um, you can take people to the airport. You can take people to the bus station. That's a little bit more challenging if you don't speak Spanish because if there's a problem, then it gets a little bit hairy, but it's still something you can do. You can make lunches and to-go bags. Um, when we weren't doing the intake, um, we were making peanut butter and jelly sandwiches, um, which is a whole nother topic about how I really wish I could have done a cooking ministry that had more culturally appropriate food for people. Um, but peanut butter and jelly sandwiches are cheap and they'll last a while. And that's really important. You can help uh, hand out the hygiene kit so that people can take a shower, get a towel, you know, that sort of thing. You can help people get clothes that they need. So that's all things that if you only speak English, you can do. Um, I do think it's important and powerful to have a, a clergy presence there. And I was very grateful for the clergy presence. Um, I think one of the things that I would 
tell people is definitely take hand sanitizer because after being in the ice boxes, everybody's got a cold. Everybody's got a cold. Um, on the first night that we were there, we actually had a little kid with strep. And just to refresh those ice boxes that you're talking about, those are the, the holding um, cells that people are held in while they're waiting for processing. Sponsor a dinner for people. Um, even if you don't speak Spanish, you can buy, you know, 20 pizzas and that'll feed people, you know? So there are ways to get involved and don't let the fear of I'm not good enough keep you from getting involved. Any last questions, Aisha, or Michael, or Jessica? Well, I was wondering if Annunciation House sounds like one of the core places that, let's say, you know, individual congregations can reach out to so that it's not just a mass of people kind of showing up, but so that it's coordinated and actually helpful. So um, there's a lady at UUSJ who helps, or UU College of Social Justice, there we go. And her name is Deva Jones. And she was the person who coordinated all of this. Um, so I would say get in contact with her um, if you're interested in going down um, because she can tell you what the needs are and when's the best time to go and, and that sort of thing. Um, and then um, Annunciation House is the big player in the area. There's also an organization called Borderlands Rainbow Center, I believe it's called. And it's a shelter for LGBTQ folks. And they're doing LGBTQ refugee liberation work. Um, so they're also a major player and doing really great work and definitely want to give them a shout out. And I'll put that um, link in the chat and on the, um, the podcast as well so mm -hmm. that folks can have that. Mm -hmm. There it is. Well, thank you so much, Alex, for being here. We really appreciate you taking time. And, and I know um, you had to change around your schedule at work in order to be able to um, take your own personal lunchtime for this. So I really appreciate you doing that. Um, and, you know, just taking us through this experience and um, the grace that you've shown um, both to those folks who needed it, but also uh, to witness to us you know, where we need to be as a faith. I really appreciate it. So thank thank you. you. Well, thank you for ha um, so having me week. and thank you for everything you've done for our faith. Both you, <laughs> both you and Asia, Christina and Asia, you have been rock stars of getting us and pushing us to where we need to be. And I love you all for all the work that you're doing. And, and hopefully this is a way that we get collective liberation. Absolutely. And so Amen. we're going to be continuing this, this theme. Uh, next week, we're going to be talking with Latifa Woodhouse about the refugee crisis in the European Union. And uh, Latifa has uh, founded a um, nonprofit organization, I believe it's based in Greece, but she will come and tell us um, about what that's looking like and how she got involved, how she got started, how she um, you know, was able to grow that into an actual relief organization. So join us next week. And I think that's all for this week. Bye, everybody. Bye.